Tonight's video is brought to you by Chill Frog CBD. Chill Frog CBD is providing the most effective, highest value products to help people responsibly and naturally find their chill in this incredibly stressful world. Everything you purchase from Chill Frog CBD is organic, premium quality ingredients made in the USA with things sourced from the USA as well. It's also an incredibly good value, and it's incredibly accessible to those who haven't tried it yet. And if you're nervous about it, Chill Frog makes it very approachable with simple and clear explanations with every order. If it sounds like something you're interested in or just want to try, check out the link at the top of the description and then use code DAVIS30 for 30% off your entire order. And find your chill with Chill Frog CBD. Thanks for the sponsor. And thank you all for listening. Marley was dead to begin with. That's a good opening line. Damn good opening line. One sentence pulls you right in with multiple questions hitting you in the face all at once. Who was Marley? What's his role in all this? How did he die? The list goes on. Yeah, that's a good beginning. What if I were to tell you that I was dead to begin with? That's right. It's obviously bullshit since this was written by me, so there's no investment there. No questions chomping at the bit aside from why the hell are you lying or something of that nature. We're already thinking about moving along, right? Nothing to see here but some ass hat off his rocker, claiming to be a literal ghostwriter. That's the thing, though. For all intents and purposes, or intensive purposes, as my mom used to say, I am dead. I don't exist, you see. There's no paper trail for me, no driver's license, no hospital records, not so much as a P.O. box to my name. Even if I were to tell you my birth name, which I won't, you won't find a record of my ever having existed. Whether that was of my own accord or theirs, I can't even say anymore. It doesn't matter, though. Not really. Yes, I chose to fall off the grid after everything that happened, but there's nothing indicating I ever existed before all of that. It's better this way. Better for everyone involved. Hang in there, man. I'm getting to the point, I promise. Yes, I didn't hit you with a fantastic opening line, well, other than the ones provided by Mr. Dickens, but there is a story to tell. Will you believe it? Honestly, probably not, but I'd like to share it with you nonetheless. Ten years ago, to the day, was when it happened. The incident that transformed me from a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, average soldier boy with a bright future serving his country to an unknown hermit hiding away from the world and its occupants. I do miss it sometimes, being a part of the world, or at least the convenience of going into a store and picking up what I need without having to keep my eye on a watch. Not to mention the glorious scents surrounding me at even the dingiest of dive bars. It's the little things, you know? The shit we take for granted when it's easily within reach. Maybe that's how I should have started this. I was alive to begin with. Sure, it doesn't have that same shock factor or slug in the gut sensation of how the late Mr. Marley kicked the bucket, but it's more fitting to my situation. <sighs> I don't mean to ramble, but this is probably the closest thing I've had to a conversation in some time. I may have lapsed in my social skills department. It was Thomas who noticed the lights at first. He and I were posted to the watchtower back at the military base. Wasn't much to see at night out there, surrounded by a little more than a vast desert, but we had been on that damn tower every night for three weeks straight. Jacob Thomas was a private, first class, while I was second class. I was still pretty green at this point, and while he technically outranked me, he wasn't much more of experienced. He was a good guy, though. A big, intimidating-looking black guy, but he had a heart of gold to anyone who knew him. He was probably the first friend I made on base, and... He was a good one to be around if any shit broke out. I was in pretty decent shape, but I had nothing on Thomas. Yeah. 
He didn't deserve what they did to him, but I can't say any of us did. Honestly, I wouldn't claim that they deserved what happened to them either, not entirely anyway. So, once again, we were guarding that damned watchtower. Honestly, it feels like we were just up there for giggles and shits for the most part, but it was necessary to keep it manned. And we were some of the lower ranked on the base. I was, anyway. We still managed to have some fun, just shooting the shit and such. Thomas even taught me to hustle poker up on that tower, something that would come in handy later in life. Those are stories for another time, though. Of course, I can't necessarily predict if there will be another time, not with me exposing myself like this. Before I go any further, I imagine some of you may be wondering not only where the base is located, but what branch of the military I served in. Well, I'm afraid I won't be answering either of those questions, given the risk I'm already taking. As for any names I drop, they may or may not be the true identities of the people I served alongside. I apologize for this, and I don't mean to sound in any way deceptive, but none of these facts bear any real impact on the events I'm attempting to describe here. I was sitting on the floor, working on my shuffling, when Thomas sort of slapped his hand on my shoulder. I thought he was just messing around at first, but he kept tapping me more aggressively the longer I ignored him. When I finally looked up to see what he was getting at, he was just staring at the sky, wide-eyed and slack-jawed. I probably looked about the same when I saw those swirling lights. I'm not one to believe in things like UFOs, but the way that trio of lights moved didn't seem like anything man-made. They just sort of spiraled around each other as if giant fireflies were happily dancing away above us. It was honestly quite mesmerizing, and I couldn't even convince my eyes to blink, let alone look away. Thomas looked bewildered, as I did, while we both just gazed at the night sky, but when the lights just stopped moving, I could swear they felt like three beady eyes just staring right back at us. They hovered in an almost straight line, nearly blending with the stars for a moment, though they were far brighter than any star I'd ever seen. For minutes we held that dead stare until the one in the middle shot toward the ground, with the remaining two darting upwards out of view within seconds. I halfway expected the one that fell from the heavens to suddenly shoot right at us, but it didn't stop until it impacted the ground, maybe a few miles from the base. The ground shuddered, as though we were experiencing a sudden earthquake, but even after the sensation died down, nobody else came out of their quarters to check it out. That alone was just as perplexing as the light's arrival in the first place. The fact that no one else responded to what could have easily sounded like some sort of attack on the base. Thomas and I just looked at one another, back to the compound and out into the darkness beyond its walls. I suggested we wake the base commander, but when Thomas suggested we go check it out ourselves, I was reluctant, to say the least. Not only were we charged with manning the tower until dawn, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to investigate whatever had hit the ground, just the two of us. There was something determined in his face, and he did technically outrank me, so I wasn't about to argue with him, though I wish I'd had the guts to stand my ground looking back. I couldn't have predicted how things would turn out, but... I should have followed my gut on this one, even if it would have driven a wedge between Thomas and me. Probably some of the other guys, too. Though I was somewhere between nervous and utterly terrified, something I wouldn't admit to myself at the time, I followed the big guy out into the night. My heart was racing when he cranked up one of the jeeps, and I just knew that someone would hear us slap shackles on our wrists for attempting to go a wall and toss us into the brig. Of course, nobody had heard or felt the ground shake, so I wasn't overly surprised when we sped away from our post in the direction of where the shimmering light had impacted, with nobody in pursuit. It wasn't hard to find where it landed, given that it was still glowing vibrantly from the otherwise darkened desert. It was further out than we'd initially expected, though. Still only took around five or ten minutes to track it down, but we were gunning it pretty hard. Not only did we not want our little cloak and dagger mission to be discovered, but I think we were both as excited about what we may find out there, if a good deal apprehensive. 
By the time we parked the jeep next to the deep and wide crater, the bright, almost orange glow we'd seen from a distance had become a vibrant red. It almost made my eyes burn to look at it, but I couldn't force myself to look away. I was so zoned out, just staring at the almost human heart-shaped beaming object that I was only vaguely aware of Thomas making his way into the crater. When he skidded down the steep angle a bit, seeing him fall somewhat snapped me out of it. I called out to him to see if he was okay, or at least I think I did anyway. It sounded like the words weren't coming from me, more as though I was a ways back from whoever was shouting, though I could feel the vibration in my throat, assuring me that I was indeed the one who spoke. It's hard to describe, but that's how it felt. To make matters even more confusing, as well as quite alarming, when I found myself standing beside Thomas in the dead center of the crater, I didn't even recall descending. I could feel every hair on my body stand on end while my fingers and toes tingled as though I were growing intoxicated. Now that I was right on it, I could see that the object was pulsing, making it even more akin to a large basketball-sized heart beating, though it did not pump blood, only that warm and vibrant light. Regardless of how increasingly drunk I felt, the longer I gazed at this wondrous thing, I still began to panic when Thomas crouched down, wrapping his hands around the still pulsing object. Every aspect of my inebriated state faded away when my friend began to convulse, still gripping onto the thing. I tried to pull him away, but only succeeded in getting my own hands almost glued to his shoulders for a moment. It was almost how I imagined grabbing onto someone being electrocuted would be though I was able to break my hands free from him after a moment. With that having failed, I attempted to kick the shining rock away from him, but that was a fool's errand at best. Even if it hadn't been buried into the ground, it felt like I hammered my boot against the solid concrete wall. Whether it was incredibly dense or just buried deeper than I could see, I couldn't say, but it wouldn't budge. Finally, having a few other options available to me at the time, I ran about five feet up the crater before hauling ass back to where Thomas still spasmed on his knees. It hurt like a son of a bitch when I rammed into him with my shoulder, but it did succeed in breaking one of his hands loose for a moment at least. As soon as I flopped to the side of him, his hand whipped back to the glowing heart like it was a magnet of some kind. Without taking time to rethink my actions, I ran further up the crater, almost to the top. I sped toward my friend as quickly as my legs could carry me before straight up tackling him when I got close enough. I felt my head spin for a moment, but when I regulated my dizzy brain, I could see that I had succeeded this time, though Thomas was still convulsing. His face looked almost catatonic while his body twitched and trembled, but he was free from the object finally. As I previously mentioned, he was a big guy, so it was no easy task dragging him up and out of the crater and back to the jeep. When I got him loaded up and buckled into the passenger seat, he'd finally stopped convulsing, but he was still out of it. His eyes were wide and his expression looked downright horrified, but I had to get him away from that thing and back to the base. I had no idea what time it was when we headed out in search of the beating heart that fell from the sky, but I was sure... It was far from dawn. When the sun began to rise, as I pulled the jeep back up to the base, I could only imagine how long I'd been zoned out before coming back to my senses. Though I was somewhat relieved to be back, I had no doubt I would be in a world of shit for leaving my post in the middle of the night. Without getting into the immediate threats from the base commander, completely neglecting the catatonic soldier in the passenger seat at first, suffice to say, we were both in some hot water for our actions. Of course, those were the least of Thomas's problems at the time. Gregory Nolan, the commander, was a shot and perpetually red-faced man with obvious self-esteem issues. He waved his authority around like a damn baseball bat and made sure everyone knew he was in charge. Surprisingly, once he ceased his little tantrum and fully took the state of one of his men, his angered demeanor gave way to genuine concern. Having never witnessed this side of the man before that day, it took me a minute to realize he'd stopped yelling. He called the medic and arranged for Thomas to be transported to the MTF, recommending that I get looked at too, but not before telling him the truth about what happened. He didn't exactly believe me at first. 
He wasn't a hard guy to read, even to someone as green as I was, but he still played the part well enough. After the medic gave me a quick once-over, and ultimately deciding that I was good to go, Nolan had me drive him and a couple of the boys out to where the thing had landed. He was quite lost for words when he couldn't deny I had been telling the truth, but he promised I would still have to answer for leaving my post. Thomas, too, if he came out of it okay. In the end, once everything was said and done, he never followed through on those threats. I could tell I judged him too harshly when we first met, but none of that matters anymore. Sometimes when I look back at how all of this started, I think I may have grown to respect Greg Nolan had I met the more human side of him sooner. Though I could tell that he and the guys were tempted to move in closer and check out the still pulsing heart-shaped rock, I managed to snap them out of that same trance that had me at first. Yes, his red face looked fit to burst when he realized I'd slapped my hand across it, but only until he understood why I had to. Still made my ass clench for a moment, I'll tell you that shit for nothing. Within the day, after many calls were placed, a truckload of incredibly important looking individuals showed up, and the crater would be sealed off behind a large tent and heavily armed guards. What they did with that rock, or... What they found out about it, I can't say I will ever know, but those are answers I hope to find someday if I ever hope to put a stop to what's happening to me. Whichever way that goes, I haven't laid eyes on that pulsing heart since the higher-ups in the fancy suits arrived. There were about twenty of them in all, men and women of varying ages, dressed far nicer than anyone else on the base. The lady who seemed to be in charge looked to be around her mid-forties, her dark hair aligned with streams of gray, tied into a tight bun, a three-piece pinstriped pantsuit, and an expression that read like she hadn't smiled once her whole life. They had some folks in full radiation suits head out to the site, which was now off-limits, even to Nolan. After that first day, we didn't see much of any of them. A few of the seemingly lower-ranked folks would come and go from time to time. What began to happen with Thomas, though, brought their attention back to us. Unfortunately, that wasn't until things had gone too far. He was still out of it, though the medics would keep a close eye on him and even allowed us to check on him here and there. By the time they realized what was happening, well, there wasn't much they could do. His vitals had been rocky at first, but even though he remained catatonic, everything read like he could jump up and do a backflip at any moment. The doc said that he seemed in even better physical shape than he had before any of this, but he couldn't figure out why his marbles hadn't returned. As it turned out, after I had to undergo a good deal of testing myself, I was also in a much better condition than I had been in my last evaluation. Given that it hadn't been long since then, they put me through the ringer. Strength testing, endurance, speed, even submersion. I knocked it out of the park on everything they threw at me. The most I'd ever been able to bench was around 225 pounds, but I was now pressing 300 without so much as breaking a sweat. I didn't appear any bigger or more defined than I was, but I was stronger and faster than I ever thought I could be. At the time, I could only imagine what Thomas would be capable of if he ever came out of this coma. He was a veritable beast before any of this, so if that rock had done this to me, he could be full-on Hulk by this point for all we knew. None of us understood what was really going on, even after the sickness broke out. Over that first week, just about everyone began to come down with it, all at varying intervals. Two or three one day, another couple the next month, and so on until anyone who had spent more than a day on the base caught it. The symptoms weren't too bad at first. Some fatigue, low-grade fevers, but they got worse quickly. It even hit the medics hard, leaving just about everyone on the base bedridden. Everyone but me. When those who had been investigating the meteorite caught wind of it, it didn't take them long to put it together. That Thomas and I were essentially feeding on the life force of those around us. It was far more complex than that, mind you, but that's what it boiled down to. It would seem that the mental degradation of just about everyone posted at this military base was the reason that nobody figured out what was going on. I became consumed with guilt that I hadn't realized the suffering I caused, but... 
it was discovered that I'd been experiencing something of a euphoria from what drained the others. The knowledge that I had essentially been drunk on siphoning life from folks I was close to didn't help my conscience, but I was assured that I couldn't have known, given the extreme and unusual circumstances. By the time Thomas and I were separated from everyone, locked away in a facility far from the base at a location we were not privy to, several of the troops had lost the fight, with many more in rough shape. I would learn some years later that a little over half of them did survive. I had committed every name to memory, even those I didn't interact with much, so I did some browsing online at a library in the nearest town. Some were left with a few more limitations than they had before, but many of them made a full recovery. That fact helps me sleep a little better at night sometimes. Even with our glorified captors in nice suits insisting that none of this was our fault, we became little more than prisoners while they ran their experiments on us, likely to see how they could weaponize us. Yes, Thomas was still in a coma last I saw him, but we remained the only two who had come in direct contact with the pulsating rock that fell from the sky. Where they'd taken that, or where it may be now, I have no idea, but supposedly they took the utmost precautions while investigating it. For what felt like months... I was locked away in that cell, barely having contact with anyone but the ones who could poke and prod me for hours in a day. They all wore radiation suits when dealing with whatever each day had in store for me, and I assumed it was the same with Thomas, though they wouldn't tell me shit about his condition. Sure, they outfitted my glorious cage with a TV, cable, limited internet access, and even an Xbox to pass the time, but I still felt like America's most wanted, no matter how much they tried to sugarcoat it. I can't say how long I was cooped up in that place before things took a turn for the even more bizarre. It was some time late at night, while I was tossing and turning, trying my damnness to sleep away some of those endless and tedious hours when the commotion broke out. From my room, it sounded like a veritable war was being waged somewhere beyond my door. I had no windows, being apparently below ground level, nor could I open my door to see what was happening, but I wondered if some sort of militia had gotten wind of a potential new weapon and sought to liberate it. The echoing gunfire combined with the screams of men and women alike, assuring me that I would be unlikely to survive whatever was going on, that I'd find myself in a far less hospitable prison cell soon enough. I'd be wrong on both counts, though. Still don't know if that was a good thing. After what sounded as though the floors above me were near collapsing down upon me, causing the entire facility to feel like it was trembling and breaking apart, I heard something that damn near caused my legs to give out from beneath me. It was some sort of wailing shriek that I feared may belong to some sort of feral beast. I almost wondered for a moment if that beating heart-shaped rock was some sort of egg, and what plundered through the place was whatever hatched from it. No, I wasn't entirely correct in that irrational assumption. I wasn't too far off either. When something began to pound on the door to my cell, I could hear bullets ricocheting against the steel walls, along with that same aggravated shrill squeal. I pushed myself back against the wall as though there were a snowball's chance in hell of me escaping either this thing's path of destruction or the cage itself. I watched the thick metal door warp more with every thrust against it, shivering from head to toe like a frightened child, afraid of the monster in the closet. I just stared on, terrified of what was to come, when the door buckled, bending in the center and splitting from its hinges. As what looked to be large, rock-like fingers with glowing red veins wrapped around the top of the heavy door, peeling it away like the lid of a sardine can. I screamed out, practically petrified of the brutal death I was about to experience when I heard what was left of the door seemingly being tossed back down the hallway, effectively silencing the gunfire for some time. I could barely believe my eyes when Thomas poked his head through the gaping hole in the room before his bulging upper half followed behind. His face looked anguish, still mostly human in its appearance, but his body had been altered dramatically. Both of his shoulders looked like hardened and battle-worn boulders, with the left being significantly larger than the right. His arms and hands were that same texture and engorged scale as was his chest and the left half of his torso. 
His legs appeared mostly unaltered, though there were some splits in his pants where the graveled flesh pushed through, though I could barely understand how they could support such a massive structure. All over and across, my friend, even the parts that still looked human, branched those glowing red veins which pulsed beneath the surface. I no longer screamed as I stared upon what had become of a man I considered a friend, but I was certain my end was near. It wasn't until he held his hand out toward me, assuring me that he would not hurt me, that I saw he was still in there, that he still had control. He told me in a somewhat altered yet familiar voice that we had to get out of here, something I could not argue with at that point. Yes, I was quite literally between a rock and a hard place, but I didn't yet know if what had become of him was due to whatever experiments they'd put him through, or the natural progression of what seemingly infected us both. Regardless of a great many questions I desperately needed answers to, I took to his gargantuan hand after which he picked me up, hanging me from his bulging shoulders like a kid going for a piggyback ride. He told me to keep my head down and tried to stay as hidden as possible before he charged back down the hallway. As we rounded the corner, I almost gagged at the sight of four men who were practically crushed against the wall by what remained of the door to my cell. When we reached the end of that hallway to see an elevator next to an opening to a flight of stairs, Thomas spun quickly to take the brunt of the gunfire that erupted from our left. I winced with every bullet that hit him, but even those that nailed his still human flesh could not rip through. They just bounced off him, landing on the ground by his feet. I hoped he would just sprint up the steps, but when he charged toward the armed men, I braced myself for what was coming next. I closed my eyes to not see what was happening, though I couldn't shield my ears from the sounds of the screams and tearing flesh of those who attempted to shoot Thomas down. I still hear those sounds when I close my eyes, even after all these years. The high-pitched shrieks of men being ripped limb from limb aren't something you easily forget, I suppose, nor the spray of their blood against the walls and floor. I think it's those very things that keep me determined to stay hidden from the world. Not just what I heard and saw that day, but the guilt of it, you know. Yes, we could have never predicted what could have come of our curiosity back then, but I still bear the burden of it. When Thomas put a swift end to the gunman, he finally made for the stairs, which I hoped would be the end of all this madness. Sure. One flight led to another, and more after that, but those in charge of the facility weren't about to give up on us, even after all the death and destruction. Those first five floors went smoothly. Nobody pursued from behind, nor burst through the doors we passed on each floor. But that sixth floor didn't go so well. I was at the point of feeling like we'd never see the outside world again. Uncertain about exactly how deep under the ground we were when the stairs came to an end at the top of the fifth flight. As soon as the big guy pushed that door open, all hell broke loose from the other side. He quickly pulled the door back shut, even with the gunfire tearing into it before us. He pulled me from his back, turning in place to keep me shielded from the barrage of bullets, attempting to get through before placing me gently onto the steps. With the calamity right outside the doorway, I could barely make out what he was saying, but from what I could hear, he told me to stay put until he could clear a path. He smiled at me, like a full-on, genuine, compassionate smile, before he turned on his heels, smashing through what was left of the door. It sounded ten times worse than what my ears had witnessed from my cells. Guns of both large and small caliber fired a seemingly endless wealth of ammunition, while voices shouted and screamed, both begging for mercy and promising none at the same time. That haunting, shrill squeal I knew to belong to my friend echoed from beyond the doorway, while one firearm fell silent after another. A tearing of flesh and spurts of sticky blood all blended into one horrific and grotesque sound that didn't resemble anything my reeling mind knew how to comprehend. I couldn't tell if I was screaming from the shock and horror of what I heard, or if I hoped I could drown it out in some way. Even while I pressed my palms to my ears, I could still make out everything. It felt like hours had passed by the time the battle fell silent, but I still violently trembled, sitting upon those steps where my friend had placed me. 
I don't know how long I stayed in that same spot, nor how long it took to regain control of my extremities, but when I did finally push my body free from my perch, my legs threatened to draw me right back down that flight of stairs. Once I stabilized myself, grabbing onto the slightly scarred railing and placing one foot on the next step, I was still quite reluctant to see what lay ahead of me. When I did finally peek my head through the opening, I couldn't stop myself from falling back to my knees, retching across the blood-soaked floor. It looked as though a bomb had gone off, but somehow neither scorched the buildings of the bodies. There was nowhere in the wide-open room I could look without seeing some sort of carnage. Limbs that had been seemingly torn from sockets scattered the floor and hung from the walls and ceiling, glued in place by sticky gore. Ripped torsos, disembodied heads, and shredded chunks of tissues, I couldn't even wager a guess as to what it once was lined practically every inch of the room. In all honesty, for a moment, I almost thought I'd died and gone straight to hell as my mind could barely conceive such a sight in the world I knew. One thing I couldn't see, even when I allowed my eyes to focus for seconds at a time, was any sign of Thomas, or what he was now, anyway. Granted, I was making every effort not to look at the grotesque spectacle around me as I made my way through the large room, but given how he looked before, I was certain he would stick out like a proverbial sore thumb. If nothing else, once I noticed the windows ahead of me, I realized we had indeed reached ground level. When I passed through the opening where another door had seemingly sat in place before all of this, I saw Thomas just sitting on the ground, panting heavily. He was covered in blood, which, now that I could see the damage to his body, I realized did not exclusively belong to the bodies inside. I can't imagine what they threw at him to tear through the hardened flesh, since gunfire didn't even leave a scratch, but he was in rough shape. I sat down beside him, unsure of what my next steps should be, as well as if there would be anything I could do to help him. He gave me a weakened smile, assuring me that he was beyond help something he'd accepted before breaking us out of that place. The realization that he caused all that destruction just to get me out made me feel both guilty and somewhat overwhelmed. Yes, I hadn't exactly enjoyed being treated like a lab rat over God knows how long, but I never wanted this. I didn't speak those words to my friend, though. Not with him appearing as though he was nearing the end. He told me about some of what they put him through, even after he finally awakened from his coma. He didn't take in what was happening at first, being that the last thing he remembered was climbing down into that crater. He'd been unable to prevent essentially consuming everything they fed to him, anything from a variety of animals to volunteers who had no idea what they were signing up for. He fought against it. The draining of every ounce of life force they locked up beside him, but it was no use. Whatever that rock did to him, he was more of a magnet than a vampire, unwittingly charging himself while one after another passed away before his eyes. I can't even imagine what something like that does to a mind, especially one as caring and compassionate as Thomas's. I would think that's what caused him to snap something I likely would have done myself had I been exposed to what he had. At first, as he told it, it took days for him to fully drain a man, but the more he began to mutate, the faster it went, taking only a matter of hours, the bigger he grew. Though neither of us could say for sure, being that we had been separated since all this madness began, it would seem I had been infected by that rock too, but to a far lesser degree than Thomas. I stayed with him until the end, even when I heard the choppers approaching from a distance. I made it out of there before they arrived, but I was sure they'd spotted me as I darted into the woods surrounding the facility. Whether they had their hands full with the state of things I left behind, or they simply didn't notice me, I couldn't say, but I was moving quickly, and far more so than I was able to before all of this. When I got to a highway, I hitched my way across the country, making sure not to draw any unwanted attention. 
I contacted my uncle, who always been something of a survivalist, and he helped me get set up where I'm now, and have been since everything went down. I kept any in-person interactions to a minimum in hopes of keeping him safe, especially since he already had his fair share of medical issues. Over those years of hiding away from the world, I did a bit of my own experimenting, not with any people, but with the wildlife around here. I'm not proud of doing my animal testing or anything, but I had to know how long it takes for my body to feed off the living. To my reckoning, there seems to be about a two-hour window within 15 yards or so, a little less, any closer than that, before my body begins to feed. I couldn't bring myself to test how long it takes to fully drain anything, nor do I want to hasten my possible transformation either. But I at least have an idea of my limitations. From what I can tell, that's the maximum range I have to worry about, but I still don't want to take any chances. I even set up an electric fence around the perimeter to not inadvertently feed off anything in my sleep. There's a town some miles away. Far enough not to put anyone in danger, but close enough to get what I need and get out before anyone is the wiser. It's a lonely life, being out here by myself, unable to even own a pet without inadvertently consuming the poor thing, but it's better this way. I took a bit of a road trip to post this, so if all goes well, nothing can be traced back to where I am. Honestly, I'll eat a bullet before I let them do to me what they did to Thomas. I just hope that in telling the story, I can allow my conscience to rest a little. Yes, I didn't take any of those lives at the facility, but I still bear the responsibility of what happened back at the base. Even if I didn't drain as much from my fellow soldiers as Thomas did, none of this would have happened we hadn't left our post that night. I'd love to say those lights entranced us from the get-go, but it was our own ignorance and curiosity that got the better of us, a fact I could not deny, no matter how hard I try to convince myself otherwise. As for that pulsating rock that fell out of the sky, I still have no idea where that is now. Perhaps it was stored in the same place that we were imprisoned at, or maybe somewhere else entirely. It's still out there, though. I can feel it, with every beat of my own heart, as though it's still connected to that damned thing. Strangely, though I dread whatever plans they have for that thing ever coming to fruition, it's not my biggest concern. Yes, I wouldn't be remotely surprised if, even after all the blood spilled by my friend, they exposed a more willing candidate to it. Someone they can control, someone they can weaponize. What truly terrifies me is... Not only the two other lights that soared back up and out of sight, but what sent them to our world in the first place. If what Thomas was becoming, what I could become someday, was caused by only one-third of what we witnessed that night, what else could be entering our atmosphere even at this very moment? It's been a decade since that night that changed my life forever. If that was only the beginning, what else may already be here among us? Hello everyone, I'm um, sorry about the noise in the background, I'm actually <clears throat> recording this the morning after I recorded this story, but I needed something at the end, like I always do. So, um, as always, I hope you enjoyed this story, I really did. I haven't read a really good uh, alien themed story in a while, except for the one uh, maybe last week or so about the fog, but this one was more outwardly, obviously aliens. I don't know. I really enjoyed it. Um, Let me know if you did as well. And also, as for the question of the night, have you ever experienced anything extraterrestrial? Or do you believe in aliens in general? Do you think there's something out there? Do you not think something is out there? Let me know in the comment section below. I'd be really, really interested to have a conversation back and forth about that. Me, personally, I don't think there's any way that we are alone. I just don't think it's possible. There's so many different things out there that we haven't discovered. I mean, we just recently got a new <clears throat> photo from the James Webb Telescope. It was an absolutely incredible thing to look at. And it, it's just, there's no way we're alone, you know? 
maybe that's just the the optimism in me <laughs> you know i don't know let me know what you think if we are alone if we're not and if you've ever experienced something i would love to hear it maybe i can um put together a alien encounter a true scary stories video or something for everyone anyway thank you all for listening i want to give a quick thank you to all of the five dollar patrons and members Absent Alice, Amethyst, Amet, Anne Barry, Bubbly Panda, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, LSG, Frankie Brockway, Furious Weasel, If and Down Flat Out, Jennifer Dameron, Justinia Zaromsky, Jesse Jess Jess, Karen Parrott, Kat, Kathy Flanning, Laura Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, and Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nora, Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, PJ Masks, Ray Clegg, Sentinel, Nino on Gum 24, Tiger Princess, Tish Love, Triumph, and Victoria Step. Thank you all for the amazing continued support. Thank you to everyone who stops by and watches the videos, leaves a comment, leaves a like. It's really, really appreciated. I hope you all have a wonderful night. If you enjoyed this video, share it with someone else. And as always, take care of yourselves.